are joining from the Penn State Health Project Echo, uh, Jackie and Jessica, and I saw that uh, uh, they are already, uh, you know, they just joined. Um, so maybe if um, uh, we have a couple of minutes, I can ask either of them to introduce the group about Project Echo, uh, and that may be the direction we will be uh, going to, uh, you know, convert our platform to, so we can get some um, uh, CME credits, and then I think take it to the next level. So, Jackie, Jessica, if you want to please introduce yourself and tell us something about Project Echo. Hi, my name is Jackie Sable. I am an education program specialist with Project Echo. Um, Echo began about 15 years ago at the University of New Mexico as um, a, a means of helping to address the hepatitis C crisis there. The intent is to move knowledge and not patients. Um, I, from doc, talking with Dr. Farouk, it sounds like this group already has a, a wonderful start and what ECHO could bring to this is um, taking some of the work off of everyone who's involved, again, helping with getting med medical education credits for participating, um, distributing more of what you're putting together to a broader audience. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jessica. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, it's nice to see some of you. Thank you, um, Dr. Farouk. Um, yes, I'm a project manager with Project ECHO, and so we're just observing today to see what everybody is already doing and this spectacular work you are um, all, information you're all sharing with each other. And then um, just looking for ways that we can maybe help streamline things, as Jackie said, and, and help everyone out and make um, make this more about the information that you're sharing and less about the logistics. So we look forward to um, observing the, today and we hope you're all well. Thanks. Um, thank you, Jackie and Jessica. And I think I will ask uh, Dr. Ala if you want to take the lead. All right, thank you, Omar. Um, good morning, everybody. Assalamu alaikum, um, wherever you are and whatever um, time zone you're in. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about the HLA system and antibodies against it. The question is whether we want to transplant a particular patient or not. Um, this is a very, very complicated um, issue and has been made complicated because of very haphazard development in the various technologies. The nomenclature is all over the place and um, different people call different things by different names um, leading to a general all-round confusion. So what I'm going to aim um, at today is to clarify the various tests and technologies, clarify the nomenclature as best as I can. It's very difficult to do that just because some of this is already baked into the system. And then we are going to talk more about its relevance um, to how things could be done or are being done in Pakistan, rather than uh, focus too much on the deceased donor program where the HLA typing, et cetera, is way more um, uh, relevant um, in the US. Um, we need to focus this conversation um, to taking care of living related kidney transplants because by far that is the commonest group of patients we take care of um, in Pakistan. So there's no relevant conflict of interest uh, for this talk for me. And all patient identifying information has been either removed or blotted out or anonymized to the best of my ability. There's a lot of reports from Pakistan. So I've taken care of um, taking uh, away all the, all the information there. Um, if something's missed my eyes, apologies in advance. So the plan of the talk today is going to have a brief conversation about the HLA system itself. We will then devote some time on how HLA antibodies are detected. We will then talk about cross matches and then we'll talk about how to put all of this together. Um, and all the while we'll kind of focus on how to adapt uh, this practice and these principles to a resource uh, poor milieu. So uh, as I uh, don't need to elaborate too much uh, to this audience, the HLA system is one of the most highly polymorphic gene systems uh, in the human genome. 
Um, I think it is the most highly polymorphic gene system in the human genome. It is located on the short arm of chromosome six uh, and has three or four distinct zones. Obviously we have created these zones um, for um, our understanding and our explanation. So the first zone is where your, your class one loci are going to be. So A, B, and C, uh, we get one pair of A, one pair of C, and one pair of uh, B um, uh, from our parents. And the reason we need one only is we're actually only encoding one complicated uh, chain. The other molecule is a conserved beta-2 microglobulin. In contradistinction on the class two side, we have two pairs, so two DR alphas, two DR betas, two DQ alpha and DQ betas, and DP alpha and DP betas that are um, um, inherited. And the reason is the HLA class two molecule is different and has a distinct alpha and a beta chain. Now, uh, DR beta, uh, has a little bit of a um, interesting inheritance pattern. So we get one DRB1, um, so one pair of DRB1s from our parents, but then there are other genes called DRB3, DRB4, and DRB5, um, which in the older serological nomenclature were called DR51, 52, and 53. And we can get uh, either one or two of these from our parents. So the DR genes, we can have two to four, so two DR beta ones, but then we can have one or two of uh, DR beta three, beta four, and beta five. And um, uh, this, is, this is what makes sometimes analysis of these genotypes tricky. So as I mentioned, class one molecules have one large complicated uh, 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 HLA molecule um, the active chain. So the alpha chain has um, three domains, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. And um, between alpha one and alpha two is the peptide binding cleft. Uh, there's a transmembrane domain and a short cytoplasmic tail. Class two molecules, you have an alpha chain and a beta chain. You have alpha one, alpha two domains, um, beta one, beta two domain. And between the alpha one and beta one is the peptide binding groove. Class one molecules are expressed on all nucleated cells. Um, class two molecules are basically restricted to antigen presenting cells. Um, and when the innate immunity is talking to um, the adaptive immunity arm, it is the MHC2 molecule uh, which presents in its peptide binding groove the antigenic material, which then the T cells recognize and initiate an immune response. So the reason these molecules exist is that they are our identity badges. So when the immune system is surveilling cells, they look at the class one and class two molecules, and as long as they are self, we're good. These are highly antigenic molecules. And if you have um, a HLA molecule, uh, class one or class two, which doesn't look like yourself, then danger signals go up and an immune response is launched. Um, and this is why it is very, very important uh, for us to pay attention to these uh, when we are doing transplantation because transplantation wasn't an evolutionary goal. Um, the evolutionary goal is to ward off infection. And when um, the body sees a transplanted kidney in there, it thinks it's a giant bug and tries to kill it with an inflammatory response. Now the HLA haplotypes, uh, you know, one set of genes comes in from one parent, another set of genes comes in from another parent. It actually follows fairly classical Mendelian inheritance. So you've got a 25% chance. The identical is actually um, a little bit of a mis you know, it's, it's probably not an accurate statement. Two haplotype match probably is, uh, but uh, sometimes you have crossing over and so on and so forth as well. So how do you check for uh, HLA type? Now we're talking about what is the HLA type of the recipient and or the donor. So classically, we started doing this using serology. Then we uh, graduated to molecular methods. And now we are in the process of 
graduating to sequencing typing, especially after the advent of next generation sequencing. So how do you do this with serology? And you're gonna see themes of this all day long today, so bear with me. What you see here is a, a patient or a donor lymphocyte. This little triangle here is an HLA molecule. This is another triangle with an HLA molecule. You uh, pick up this um, cell, you incubate it with uh, various types of anti-HLA antibodies. Now let's suppose you've got an HLA-A2 molecule here. You incubate it with an HLA-A2 um, antibody and, um, and then you add complement. Once you add complement into this mix, um, if the proper antibody is there, it'll fix complement. It will uh, poke holes by into the target uh, cell membrane by generating an attack complement. If the in the I will seep inside, you look at it under the microscope and say, okay, this cell is dead. That means that there was this antigen present on the surface of this cell, which was fixed by the relevant antibody. So you would mark this as HLA-A2 present. And that was um, the crudest uh, possible way of uh, doing this. Uh, now these actually are broad categories. So these are called broads because the HLA-A2 uh, um, can have several other sub -ser uh, or alleles in, in the circulation. So this, these master classes are called broads. Um, and then they, they, you know, as our uh, ability to distinguish them got better, we have started splitting them. So from the serological standpoint, for instance, an A9 would be a broad category, but we will break it down into A24 and A25 today because the broad category has been split. But this has all been overtaken by molecular methods. So uh, in most, if not all of the molecular methods, the way we do this is we isolate the DNA, blood, uh, buccal mucosa, what have you, Mostly it's done through blood. Um, um, you set up a PCR and amplify the DNA. Now you can from here take it in two different directions. Mostly for practice, even in the United States, we are using molecular techniques. Um, so the two molecular techniques that you will see deployed most commonly in Pakistan today are SSP, which is sequence specific primer. So these are primers targeting the polymorphic positions um, uh, in, in different genes allowing differentiation of DNA antigens or alleles. Now understand uh, SSP can be run in low resolution or high resolution. So you can still run an SSP and declare only an allelic resolution, or you can run it at high resolution, uh, which will be more expensive, but and that will depend on the primers that you're using. Now, when you run the SSP PCR, um, you usually visualize the PCR project uh, product on uh, gel electrophoresis. The turnaround time for this is about four hours and you use software to analyze all the gel electrophoresis patterns and then spit out um, a verdict. SSO is uh, um, a sequence specific uh, oligonucleotide uh, me mechanism. This is again um, a, a PCR-based technology. Uh, and what you do is uh, you uh, carry out an initial PCR amplification followed by hybridization with luminix beads, which are loaded with oligonucleotides complementary to the sequence of interest being typed. So if your DNA that you have amplified is complementary to the sequence of interest um, and the oligonucleotide uh, probe, uh, which is loaded onto the Luminix bead, it will attach to that and then you can run it to um, through a Luminix uh, 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 machine and see where you're getting fluorescence. Some people still do it the old-fashioned way without using a Luminix machine uh, and there they um, analyze the beads through a, a colorimetric uh, um, mechanism and then um, put it through software. Um, it is sufficient for routine solid organ transplant. It is very efficient for throughput. So you will see these labs all over 
either use as a, uh, use an SSP protocol or an SSO protocol. Now, sequence-based uh, techniques after DNA amplification, uh, Sanger technique is difficult to do, so not very many people do it, but next generation sequencing has made it easy, and there are now uh, moves towards um, uh, using next generation sequencing, but we are not using it routinely. In my um, HLA lab, we use SSP or SSO depending on the circumstance. Very rarely when we really need high resolution typing, if there is an issue with, um, with identifying a particular um, allele subtype, then we, uh, then we resort to next generation sequencing. So, how do you name these um, things? Because you know you get these reports and you look at them, and I think most of us are comfortable just looking at the ser serologic equivalence, which is fine for solid organ transplants, especially live donor kidneys. That's not a big problem. But we need to know what these numbers mean when you look at the full report. So this is the uh, the uh, the gene. So HLA A in this instance is the gene. The star in the separator, it's not just a separator. When you see this star here, that means they've used a molecular method. O2 is the allele group. So this is the serologic equivalent. So in the olden days, the serology, uh, sero uh, serology based method that we used, um, this is what the allele group would be. But now we know that in this allele group, there are certain, you know, bunch of alleles. Alleles are genes in stable frequency in the population, right? So HLA A2 may have 101, 25, 22, whatever you, you know. And, and uh, so when you use a molecular method, you can actually figure out what is the allele. So this is, if you, if you have these four, usually these are two numbers. In this case, there's three. So if you have these, if you have these four numbers, that's actually called a high resolution. You've got four digit resolution and you've got the allele and you've got the subtype of the allele. Then you've got these other two numbers, uh, these other two fields. And these are um, to pick up synonymous and non-synonymous uh, mutations. So synonymous mutations are protein altering uh, and non-synonymous are non-protein altering. Uh, mutations. Usually um, for solid organ transplant, we almost never need to look at these. We only need these four numbers. These sometimes become an issue in um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And also understand a lot of this stress and confusion in HLA uh, comes in because we try to pick up how the, the, the bone marrow transplant people are doing this uh, and try to apply it to solid organ transplant. In solid organ transplant, HLA mismatch is not an issue. It's the antibody that is the issue. So if I had a six antigen mismatch um, living donor transplant or a deceased donor transplant, we do them all the time, no problems. Um, the only thing that we have to watch for is that we need to make sure we are immunosuppressing them uh, appropriately. In bone marrow transplant, huge problem. So they need to have a much better handle of um, uh, the HLA than we do. And then this final um, uh, suffix here is uh, a number of code words. So N, for instance, means null, not expressed. So what they're saying is that some of the mutations that they're picking up here are not being expressed. Uh, L means low, um, Q means questionable. So these are again things that if you have any question at any point, you can call your HLA lab and see what does this really mean. For us, most of this beyond this colon means very little. So we need to just pay attention on this. And this is all we need for most cases. So how do the antibodies bind to targets? Uh, so we all know what an antibody looks like. You've got the heavy chain, you've got the light chain, you've got the uh, variable reasons of the heavy and light chains. Uh, similarly, on the HLA molecule, there is uh, an area called the apitope. Uh, and this uh, has uh, heavy chains and light chains as well. And these are the binding face um, uh, of, um, of an HLA molecule and it is called the complementarity determining region on the HLA molecule. And this epitope binds with the antibody and the antibody binding area is called the paratope. So this is what it looks like. You've got uh, the CDR, complementarity determining region of the HLA molecule, which is actually toggling the, um, 
paratope of an antibody. And so the entire HLA molecule is not of relevance. And so this is where the science is actually going. Um, the, it's not that the antibody is going to attach to the entire HLA molecule. What it attaches to is a specific part of the HLA molecule. And this is just a 15 to 25 angstrom segment um, um, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, the, um, the HLA molecule. Um, and within this structural epitope, so let's suppose this is the structural epitope. Um, um, there's a part of this which is um, a much smaller region um, where there's a single polymorphic amino acid or a small patch of polymorphic amino acids. And this area is about three angstroms and this is called an applet. So just as within an HNA molecule, an epitope um, um, is where the action is, within an epitope, an applet is where the action is. And within an applet, we're looking at, now we can actually sequence and define these single or few amino acid polymorphisms, which lead to structural changes in the protein, which means that they lead to a change in the antigenic signature and lead to a change in the antigenicity of the, of the HLA molecule. And this is what leads to what is known as CREGS, cross-reactive epitope groups. So we talked about epitopes, small areas within an HLA molecule which lead to antigenicity, right? So now sometimes different HLA antigens can actually share some epitopes. So let's suppose you run a luminic screen and they say, well, you've got an antibody against HLA A2. Um, and you look at the, reci uh, the recipient's, um, uh, uh, sorry, the donor's uh, genotype, and there's no HLA2 there. And you say, I'm happy, let's, let's do this transplant. But the cross match is positive. Why is the cross match positive? Because the, the donor's HLA may have a molecule which actually carries the same epitope. And this leads to cross reaction of the A2 antibody to this. Um, uh, donor antigen leading to problems of uh, positive cross match or more scarily if you've transplanted antibody mediated rejection. And this is what these Craigs are defined at. There's more than 20 now. But look, if you've got an A2 um, uh, genotype, uh, you kind of screwed because it's going to cross react with a lot of other um, um, antigens. Similarly, BW6, BW4 together, they're expressed on pretty much every B uh, antigen. So if you've got antibodies against these, that shuts the door. And this is what makes the concept of calculated PRA that we use in the United States for organ uh, allocation purposes. Um, and this is where it stems from, that if you have an antibody to, let's say, A9, that's probably not too bad. But if you have an antibody to A2, uh, or if you have an A2, um, your CPR as a, a2 antibody in the in the recipient, your CPRA jumps to 48% just with this. So if you have one antibody, that causes problems. Now um, this also leads to another question: What is um, the antigenicity of HNA molecules driven by? And we just had a long discussion that it's driven by these epitopes, right? So the more epitope mismatches you have, so in this particular case, in donor A, uh, compared to the patient, they've got all the epitopes here are mismatching. That's not good. Uh, on the other hand, donor C has just one epitope, which is mismatching. The rest of them look okay. So in these particular cases, uh, donor C would be the least immunogenic um, to, to, to the patient. And this is borne out by studies. So this is a very interesting um, study that was, uh, uh, that was published last year. And so they looked at um, class two antigen mismatches, right? So you've got DQ and D DR mismatches. They looked at whole antigen mismatch. Then they looked at applet mismatch. And then they looked at amino acid mismatch. So different degrees of definition. And what they found was, Yes, if you have whole antigen mismatch, if you've got DR and DQ, if you have no DR DQ mismatch, you do great. There's no antibody production over 10 years. 
On the other hand, if you have one to two DRDQ mismatches or three to four DRDQ mismatches, you drop down. So this is not good. And we've already always known that if you have a lot of DR mismatches and DQs are in linkage disequilibrium, so DR and DQ mismatches, you're not going to do well over a long period of time. Now, um, if you do applets, you can actually disregard DQDR and just look at the applet mismatch sum. So if you have one to 10 applet mismatch, um, you are kind of somewhere in the middle, but if you have more than 11, you kind of drop down. But if you go down to an amino acid mismatch level, um, and I think I was trying to write something on this, and sorry about those scratches, uh, but you, know, you can actually figure out which patients are going to do worse just based on uh, a single molecule applet mismatch or an amino acid mismatch um, schedule. So this is again pertinent because this is, this is retrospective. Uh, this is pertinent for organ allocation and especially coming up from Canada, they're really trying to do this uh, applet based or epitope based um, um, allocation system because this also just based on the data that I've showed you is going to tell you which patients are going to generate antibody and which patients are not going to generate antibody. And also reject is not antibody generation. This is also freedom from rejection. Uh, and the, and the mis applet mismatch scores actually tell us that. But this is not ready for prime time. We are not using this in the United States. We're still using the whole HLA antigen based um, 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 allocation um, uh, scheme at this time, but this is where the science seems to be going and we'll just have to figure out how we employ HLA matchmaker into making some of these decisions for us. So <clears throat> let's see what we're doing in Pakistan now. Um, so uh, this is a report of which um, was on one of um, um, Dr. Manzoor's patients. Uh, and this is uh, from uh, PKLI. And what they're doing here is um, uh, typing class one and class two as, uh, molecules. So this, I, I've got just the class one over here. So you see A, there's a star here, and then one, um, uh, 0101. So this is A1, A32, and we know that this is four digit resolution. Um, and um, uh, so, um, this is this is the this is the um, and genotype, and they are mismatching at a one uh, a and one c locus. So this is pretty pretty straight, straightforward. Uh, and here we have um, uh, um, another of uh, the the th the same group. And I'm sorry, I didn't um, blot out this name here. My apologies for that. And they are um, uh, these are class two uh, antigens. So they are actually matching on all the class two antigens. But interestingly, look what's happening here. So the DRB345, they are just reporting 101. So it is possible that in addition to the two DRB1, they only have one DRB, but it is also possible that there was a drop off and they don't know if this is, um, this is uh, just one or they didn't catch the other one. Similarly, the DQB1s in both um, are uh, the same, um, both genes in both patients. And this could be that they're homozygous for this, or this may also be because they had a drop off. Now, this is from another lab. This is from hormone, um, I think labs or something. And here uh, they do a better job in displaying um, their alleles. Uh, so they've got the A molecule, uh, so A antigen here with a, an asterisk, oops, excuse me, an asterisk. Uh, and they are actually going for a very high resolution here. Um, and they have used an SSO based PCR. So that kind of makes me just a little bit suspicious. Uh, in the sense that SSOs usually are pretty good for four digit resolution. So um, they may be predicting uh, the, the eight digit resolution here, but it may or may not be entirely accurate. But they're getting good four digit resolution, which as I said, is way more than what we need in, um, in solid organ transplantation. Uh, so they're get, getting both 
uh, class one and class two. So they've got C locus definitions here. In the class two, they've got the DRB1. So you've got one from each um, uh, parent. And then um, um, in um, um, the DRB345, they've got DRB4, uh, which is HLA52. Uh, and um, and um, as, as, I'm sorry, uh, DR53 uh, in the zero, in the old serologic definition. And again, the NA means that they either didn't pick it up or all we are seeing is one DR um, B, uh, one antigen from the DRB345 uh, family. So this person has three DRB antigens, the two DRB1s and one DRB4. Then you've got DQB and DQA. Uh, and DPB and DPA. So this is very comprehensive uh, HLA type. Uh, this is a one genotype mismatch. And again, they've used an SSO-PCR based amplification me me method. And this has been followed up by a Luminex read. So this is very good as long as uh, they're uh, maintaining good quality control. This report is from the Aga Khan uh, University Hospital. And so they are doing uh, HLA uh, analysis using an SSP, but they are using a low resolution type with nothing wrong with that. So they are upfront about it. They say this test gives low resolution typing for HLA allele. Um, so essentially what they're doing is they're um, using a PCR, using SSP technique to amplify. And then uh, the primers that they're using are only doing allele level, uh, sorry, uh, gene level, antigen level, antigen level uh, resolution. So the HLAA, the asterisk means that it is done through a molecular mechanism, molecular methodology, which we know they're using SSP, and then they are homozygous for 24, 35, and uh, then uh, 4 and 12. Uh, on the uh, class 1 antigens, they've got DQB1 and DRB1. So they're not doing the entire um, 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 uh, DP um, uh, level uh, resolution, but for kidney transplantation, this is enough. There are rare instances of DPs causing uh, rejection. So th this, in these scenarios, if you transplant them and get into trouble later, then you can actually ask for more comprehensive screening um, at a later date. Uh, this is from another lab. They say that they're using SSP typing, but I was not impressed with, with how they have given their results. So they're giving the, uh, the uh, molecular uh, results here, and then they're giving their serologic uh, equivalence. Um, it, it works, uh, but it looks a little uh, less organized than any of the other tests that we have seen thus far. So uh, in the left panel here, we are seeing an A10, but we are not seeing anything else. So I don't know if their primers failed or if the patient is homozygous for A10, homozygous for B8, and have the BW6 uh, correct group in there. So they've amplified for that. And then on the class two, you just have the DR3, um, and which is, uh, uh, so the, and the, DRB3 uh, here, which is the serologic equivalent of uh, DR52, um, but we don't have any information on C locus. I don't have information on Q, uh, DQs, or DPs. So again, uh, this is uh, done um, based on their uh, on their disclaimer on an SSP timing typing platform, but it looks like uh, the 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 primers that they've used and the extent to which they've gone to do their, their typing is not as comprehensive. Uh, it still works um, for live donor transplants. This probably is okay as well. But in this particular patient, if this is the level of typing you have and you have an antibody mediated rejection issue later on, you might uh, get into trouble. And then uh, on the right report, there's a four digit resolution. So this is from Shifa International Hospital. There's four digit resolution by SSP. Again, A with the asterisk means that they're using a molecular method and they've got uh, the two uh, loci for A, two loci for B and two loci for C. They're doing DRB1 
um, which seems to be homozygous here, then this patient does have BRB3, uh, and um, um, uh, then they have the DQB1. Now, again, when you're looking at DRB1 here, uh, you have a blank here. So this could mean that they've, they're homozygous, that they've got two copies of O3, O1, or there was a drop-off. So you just have to be wary when you don't see this. We assume that this is just homozygous. So, you know, if you're homozygous, both the genes are going to be amplifying for O3, O1. So that's all you're going to get. Uh, but if the primers fail for the second lo lo locus, then you may actually have a DRB1 of a different type, which has not shown up in your report. Uh, in most cases, this will be fine, but will become an issue if you have, let's say, a um, DR53 antibody uh, or DR54 antibody, um, but you don't have DR54 in the, in the genotype. And um, um, that may actually lead to an issue that you'll say, well, this is not a donor-specific antibody. It probably is a donor-specific antibody, but you don't have comprehensive donor screen available here. So now we have the recipient and donor HLA. Uh, why is this important? It is important because HLA discrepancies actually lead to antibody generation. And that's the whole ball of wax for solid organ transplant. We don't want an immune response. We don't want alloreactive T cells. We don't want alloreactive B cells because then they will make antibodies. And when they make antibodies, you run into rejection issues. So, Patel and Terasaki entered the scene in the 1960s. Terasaki actually worked with Peter Medawar, but rebelled. He said that antibodies are important, and thank uh, goodness for that. Um, and so, this is the most basic concept of um, a uh, cross match, and a cross match looks for antibody as well. So you've got donor lymphocyte, it's got various types of uh, molecules on top of that, some HLA molecules as well. You incubate the donor lymphocyte with the recipient serum. Now, if you've got an antibody that is donor specific and is going to attack the donor tissues, that antibody is going to latch on to um, the, the donor lymphocyte. Now you wash it. So the only antibodies that are stuck to the donor lymphocyte are HLA antibodies. You add complement, the antibody will fix complement, drive holes in the target membrane. The target membrane will become leaky. You've got vital uh, dye floating around in this, uh, in this uh, milieu and the vital dye will enter inside the cell. The cell will look red. Um, when you look at it under the microscope. And so you look at it under the microscope, count the number of red cells and say, okay, this many, red cell, uh, this many cells are red. That means this many cells had antibodies stuck on them. This is not good. So this means that the cross match is positive, which essentially means that there are antibodies in the recipient serum, which are going to kill donor, donor cells. So antibodies are not good, and this is their seminal paper. You've all read it, so I'm not going to go into the details of this. Uh, no talk on um, antibodies or HLA or any of these topics, antibody-mediated rejection, uh, is complete without at least um, a tip of the uh, hat to this paper, probably one of the most um, uh, highly coded papers in um, transplantation nephrology. So what they looked was, if you had a positive cross match, you got into trouble very, very quickly. If you had a non negative cross match, not so much. And so that is where the CDC cross match came up. This became a mandatory test prior to kidney transplantation. Um, and if your CDC cross match was positive, transplantation was not allowed. Now, this was not a perfect test. Obviously, several people without, with the ne negative cross match also had uh, antibody mediated rejection. But we know now that, um, that um, this test has its issues uh, with sensitivity and specificity. But this is one of those paradigm bending moments uh, in science where the entire practice uh, changed. So how do you test for HLA antibody? There's cell-based tests and there's solid-based tests. So cell-based tests can be used to calculate what is called PRA, we will discuss it, or we can do cross matches, solid-phase tests, um, which could be either an ELISA-based platform 
or a bead-based platform um, can define PRAs or background antibody or can also be used to do various types of cross-match techniques. So again, cell-based uh, assays, we just talked about it. Um, you've got donor lymphocytes, you incubate it with recipient serum, add complement, and if they die, then you know that you've got antibodies in the recipient serum. But um, cell-based assays are notoriously inaccurate uh, because there's a lot of stuff that is on the cell surface, which may actually inhibit complement. There's a lot of stuff around, uh, which may actually prevent complement from joining and, um, and causing uh, a problem, or the antibody may not be strong enough um, or not be close enough um, to, to fix complement. So these were identified and fixed as we will talk in a little bit. But the same concept has been used. Now, this is not meant to be used for pre-transplant screening. This is when we are evaluating a patient and trying to assess their immunological risk, especially trying to figure out how they are going to do with a pool of um, donors. So this is of pertinence in the deceased donor transplant world. So you take a tray, uh, put in a bunch of uh, donor lymphocytes from different donors in there, put in a vital dye, add serum and complement, uh, and if the cells die, when you look at it under the microscope, you say, okay, this many cells died, which means uh, the patient has antibody against these different types of donor lymphocytes. So the higher this, it is going to, to um, match the patient. Drop is just a simple percentage. So if 34 of the 50 wells had reactions in them, the, the raw PRA is 68%. Uh, but um, in the United States now, we use what is known as calculated PRA, and we actually handicap different, uh, different um, antigens or antibodies. So if you have an antibody to A2, um, just that one antibody will make your CPRA jump up to 48. If you have antibodies to BW4, BW6, because these have large CREGs, then all those antigens would become no-gos and your CPRA would go disproportionately high. Um, and so uh, that's how you calculate the CPRA. The lab people will um, put all your specificities into a computer and they'll spit out a number, but that's what the number uh, comes out from. But in Pakistan, where we do not have a very large deceased donor program, and all we are doing as uh, all we are doing is um, living donor transplantations, these things are largely unnecessary. So why do we need solid phase assays? Because that actually takes away some of those um, um, biosurface related issues uh, that we were talking about in cell based assays. So you pick up HLA antigens, which are um, derived from EBV immortalized B cell lines. So you extract these HLA antigens, and then you can actually purify them and stick them either on polysterone beads um, and run them to a flow cytometer or run them on a Luminex platform, or you place them on microtiter plates and, um, and run an ELISA. So an ELISA for HLA antibodies, this came out 20, 22 years ago now, something like that. And it revolutionized the field for a brief moment of time before it was supplanted by Luminex-based technology. But this was a huge uh, improvement. So uh, this is an ELISA well. You've got um, an antibody sticking out to it. We know what this antibody is. Uh, uh, and I'm sorry, uh, uh, when you uh, put in the donor serum, this sticks on you have a reporter antibody with a colored product, and that would then report if you've got the appropriate antibody against that antigen uh, in that serum. So in this particular example, what you're seeing is uh, an antibody to A29 and A43. The level of the A29 antibody is higher. A43 is a little bit low, uh, and these are your positive and negative controls on the side. But um, and, and you can you can do the same thing. So ELISA, you can actually do generic class one and class two antigens, or you can do specific antigens. So you can run a uh, essentially like a single antigen bead on an ELISA uh, platform, or you can do a generic 
class one antibody, yes, no, class two antibody, yes, no answer. Um, so both for PRA purposes as well as diagnostic purposes. Or you can stick actually antigens on beads. Um, so two different types of antigens, uh, class one beads, class two beads. So this one has all class one antigens. Then you can have other beads which have class two antigens. You add serum into it. Um, so now the what's going to happen is that if there is an antibody of interest, it'll stick to um, the uh, relevant antigen. You then add a reporter um, uh, antibody with a uh, with a, uh, a, a fluorochrome attached to it and run it through a flow cytometer. So this is not done on a Luminex platform. Flow PRA is done with beads and run through a flow cytometer. Uh, this is what your normal control looks like, and this is what your sample is. So you can see that the sample is way away from, if there were no antibodies, your sample should have been in here. But the sample is shifted to the right. That means that there is some class one antibody. Similarly, over here, uh, you've got a sample shift to the right telling us that there is a class two antibody as well. Again, flow pr uh, PRA, the answer it is giving is, yes, no for class one or class two antibodies. It doesn't tell us what type of antibody we're dealing with. And so this is used either to calculate PRA for listing purposes in a disease donor program or screening low risk um, patients. Now, the Luminix revolution has really made some of this easy and some of this difficult. So what is the principle of Luminix? Pretty much close to what we had uh, for, the flow, uh, for the flow PRA. You've got beads which have got HLA antigens on them. You stick patient serum in there, wash it out. Uh, so only the antibodies that really stuck um, um, on, the, on the beads remain. Then you send in your reporter antibody, which is an anti-IgG, so an antibody that would stick on to IgG antibodies with a reporter uh, fluorescent uh, molecule. And now this bead, if it does have HLA antibodies attached to it, it will have the HLA antigen to which the HLA antibody is attached. And then you now have this reporter antibody attached to this. Um, and this thing is then run through the flow cytometer. And the neat thing about Luminix is that you have hundreds of beads and you can have different um, specificities of antigen on every bead. So every bead has its own color, which is picked up through the reporter um, um, laser on, uh, on this, uh, on this um, Illuminix platform. And then if you've got antibodies stuck into it, you've got this uh, change in, uh, in fluorescence that is picked up as well. So we know that in bead A1, for instance, there's antibody stuck to it. Now, it, there's three different levels of um, definition that are possible with Luminix. The first is, uh, actually there's four, but we'll leave the fourth one for later. So the three different um, uh, levels of definition for Luminix are the first one is where you can just say there's HLA antibodies. So you just coat them with generic HLA molecules. If there's antibodies stuck on these beads, we say, okay, there's something in there which is sticking. This is the crudest screening test that you can do. Then the second level is where you've got definitions of HLA-1 or HLA-2 molecules on these beads. So now if you come back positive, you can say, well, there's either HLA-1 or HLA-2 antibody. And the third level of definition is the highest level of definition, which is very pertinent to kidney transplantation. And we get it on pretty much everybody that we have any questions about where you have different beads with different antigenic signatures. So A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, yada, yada. And so if there is an antibody that is stuck on A1, we know that this patient has got an antibody against A1. And this is actually the good thing about the Luminex technology is that it is, it is very, very user-friendly. Um, you can avoid a lot of sync tests. <laughs> All my friends in Pakistan know what sync, sync tests are in this. All you have to do is to stick it in there and the machine does all the work and spits out a report, which is really neat. Um, and um, the downside is it's expensive. So, so this patient, uh, again, um, uh, sent to uh, the lab by our friend, uh, Dr. Manzoor, um, went for a Luminix screen test. So what are they doing here? 
They're, they've got the Luminex set where it has got beads, some of them with HLA class one antigens, some of them with class two antigens. When they looked at the report, they found that there was not much going on on the class one beads, but on the class two beads, there was some positivity. So all they're reporting here is that, hey, there's some class two antibody. Now this may be nothing. This may have nothing to do with the donor or it may have everything to do with the, do with the donor, but this is just a screen. They're using the Luminex one Lambda kits. There's one other company, I think Immunocord's called, which makes um, these beads. But uh, essentially all this is telling us is that there is some antibody, either class one or class two. So this is a screening tool. If you want definition on that, you need to have single antigen beads. So what does single antigen bead mean? We talked about it. Each bead has a different HLA antigen. So one, two, three, but one bead will have just one type of antigen. Same principle, we put in the HLA antibody. If there's an antibody of interest, it will attach to that particular bead. Um, there would be a reporter uh, uh, molecule attached to it. We'll run it through the Luminex scanner and it will report um, a level. So this level is called MFI mean fluorescence intensity, which just means how much of that change is there in, um, in the report uh, which the laser has picked up. So in this particular um, uh, situation, all these red towers that you're seeing are antibodies, actually antibodies that are being reported. Now you need to know the donor's uh, HLA type to figure out if these are um, donor specific or not. So in this particular patient, they're reporting antibodies to A2. Um, and my eyesight is not very good, but that looks like A68 and 69. So very high level antibodies to those. So what, what are we doing here uh, in Pakistan? So this is um, um, a test that was done in one of the labs. I think it's hormone labs maybe. Uh, and what they are uh, doing is using something called live screen deluxe beads on a Luminex platform. So I am assuming that this is uh, one of uh, the vendors that makes these beads, which may be slightly different from one Lambda, but same, same, um, same principle. So on the left side, you have the screen, right? So you've got class one and class two antibodies. It's not gonna give us any specificities all it's giving us is a yes, no answer. The Luminex screen for HLA class um, uh, one antibodies is positive and for class two antibodies is negative. So all it's saying is there's probably some class one antibody here, no class two antibody here. That's good news to begin with, but HLA class one antibodies can be very immunogenic and pathogenic as well. So now what they've done is as a follow-up, they have done uh, a single antigen bead. So I think the LSA test I'm assuming because I couldn't find it in their methods, is probably a Luminex uh, single antigen bead test. Um, so now they're looking at class one and class two, no class two antibodies, but in the class, on the class one side, they are defining a bunch of sensitivity. So you're actually getting that there is an antibody to B73 um, at an MFI of about 5,000. So that's useful information and the clinician will then take this into account when they make their decision whether to go forward with the transplant or not. This is from Pickley uh, and here they are reporting class two antibodies. So they have looked at uh, the donor type here and now they're reporting that in the recipient serum there is an antibody to DQ6 at an MFI of uh, 7,000 or so. So this is very important information to come to the clinician because now they have to make the decision whether, uh, whether this is an assumable risk, whether they can transplant this, or whether this is too much of a risk uh, for antibody mediated rejection and we should abandon this particular donor. So Dr. Al, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think just, just oh. for the, so the M MFI cutoff Yes, um, I think that's that's an important concept, and uh, I'm not sure if you have that covered later. But is that is that a good time to talk about it? Right here. Okay, excellent. Because I think that's for for the clinicians. I think that's probably a very useful information. 
Sure, absolutely. Uh, maybe I just, I'm just highlighting that this is something we need to pay more attention to. Sure, absolutely. So, um, so what's in an MFI? Because this is a very, very nebulous number because as clinicians, we need numbers to look at. You know, what is the difference between 2000 and 2100? Um, so if it's 2000, we'll probably take it. If it's 2100, we won't, right? So we have to kind of put some nuance into that. Uh, and I'll also tell you how this differs in the deceased donor world versus the living donor world. So <clears throat> in an ideal world, um, you would have beads with good antigen um, molecules, HLA molecules represented on them, which would not interfere with anything else. And when you put in the appropriate antibody, it will toggle all those genes. The fluorescence will come up when you put in the reporter antibody. And this is what the MFI would look like. This is your control. This is where they should be. But when you have antibody that is attached to this bead, it will move your report to the right and you'll have this fluorescence. And so this actually, the change in this will define your MFI. So intuitively we say the higher the change, the higher the MFI. Now, there can be several issues uh, that we need to take into consideration um, when we are making some of these decisions, because that's where we have these unexpected um, discrepancies where you have a very low MFI and a very strong cross match or a negative cross match and a very high MFI. So um, how do you resolve some of those issues? So if your beads are denatured or not well made, um, then even though you have a lot of antibody, uh, a lot less will actually toggle onto those beads and you are going to have a lot less fluorescent signal. So in this particular situation, what you're gonna have is um, a, an MFI which is deceptively low. It should be here because there's enough antibody here to drive this to the right, but there's not enough antigen on the bead because the bead is, um, is defective or denatured. There may be found by be other bodies that are what you're seeing even your control is a little to the right the MFI is to the right but you're not sure uh, which one is important or not um, there may be interfering factors so uh, sometimes these interfering factors um, trigger um, a false falsely low MFI so you're not allowing the HLA antibody to join let's suppose this person has got lupus or this person has got um, has had uh, some other uh, treatment recently with the campath or something, and that antibody is interfering, um, uh, interfering with your bead. And if you pronase this and drop off that antibody and then run the test, you may actually find that you've got a very high MFI uh, that is present in the uh, in the um, in that particular specimen. And then more importantly for the immunology lab and the clinician is the concept of epitope um, uh, sharing between beads. So we, we talked about um, how different epitopes can be shared, right? So let's take the example of uh, a BW6 um, uh, situation where all four of these beads have BW6. Now the patient has only one gene, right? So all of his BW6 are going to be on that particular gene, but in this specimen, the BW6 is present on four, five, six, 10 beads. Now, when you put antibody in there, it is, it is spread across all these beads, and you're going to see in a particular bead, in a particular, so in B35, in B6, in B12, you'll see low levels of activity, but that means that that antibody has been, um, shared between several different beads and the actual MFI of that antibody, which is the effective MFI is very high. And we'll take a look at, uh, we'll take a look at some of these examples. So this is, this is a schematic um, to show the effect of antigen density on beads. So this is uh, a Luminex platform and it has beads that have been saturated by an antibody that binds to every bead. So these are not different HLA antibodies. And you see that the MFI on different beads um, uh, varies from very high to quite low, although it's supposed to be 
stable across the board. So this is just because of the antigen density of the bead, and this is just the the nature um, of um, of the of the test. Now. Um, in this particular situation, uh, there's an, an interference issue. The flow cytometric cross match was strongly positive, but on NEAT serum, there was no antibody detected against donor specific antigens. So these are the donor specific antigens, the mismatched donor antigens. So if there's an antibody that is going to cause problems, right, it is going to be against these antigens, but there's no antibody against these antigens, yet the, the, um, the cross match is is um, very positive. So um, essentially what, what happened over here was that there was an interfering antibody. And so they treated this, um, uh, this uh, serum with uh, diethyltretol, DTT, which actually causes the, the, uh, the non-HLA antibody to drop off. And once they reran the test after DTT treatment, you see that the A2 antibodies have jumped up, which explain why there was uh, an, anti uh, an antibody uh, a positive cross match there. And so this is the concept of the shared beads that we were talking about. So we've got a BW6, the mismatch antigen is the B35. The antibody being reported is very low, but when you look at it, the antibody is actually being shared by, by all these antigens. And so once you correct for that, you'll find that the total BW6 load is in an MFI of more than 20,000, and that's what's driving the cross match towards B35. So these are things that your HLA lab should be doing. Um, and I think based on the reports I've seen, some of them would be very good at doing that. Some of them, maybe not so much. So you have to find your partners in the HLA labs carefully who will give you good information when you need it. So we come back to this question of what's in an MFI. What's um, an acceptable range of antibody? That's a very difficult question to ask. Now in the uh, deceased donor allocation system world, different um, units have their own MFI cutoffs. Some people say, I will not even consider an antigen to which my patient has an antibody more than a uh, thousand MFI, and they use it across the board. Now that's kind of um, without some nuance. There are many things that we need to consider when we see what antibody is important and what antibody is not. So um, several class two antibodies like DPs, DQs, they are expressed in a much lower level on, on the endothelium, which is all we care about. Uh, and so I may actually accept a DQ antibody or a DP antibody at a level of 5,000 if it's not moving the cross match, but I might not accept an antibody in that level to a class one or a DR uh, antigen. So it depends on where things are. So when we are plugging these numbers for uh, acceptance of organs, um, for most patients, there are cutoffs. Some people would use 2,000, some people we would use 2,500. The more, rest, uh, more um, um, defensive ones would use 1,000, um, but uh, we have to put in a number to see what is acceptable risk for our program and what is not. It is a little different in live donors because in live donors, we're looking at a particular donor recipient pair and we can then make a risk assessment. Um, well, this is a DQ antibody at 4,000. The, 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 the cross matches are completely cold. Maybe I can do this, but we always have to understand that if you have pre-existing antibody, you are at a higher risk for acute antibody mediated rejection so you need to go in with, uh, with a proposition like that with your eyes open. Uh, Omar, does that answer your question or do you need more clarity on that? No, I think this is, this is perfect. I think the, I, I'm, I'm glad that you used the, uh, how different programs are using different kinds of cutoffs. Um, I think I've seen some of my colleagues using 1500. Uh, and then I think when we used to be extremely conservative, it was even lower. Um, but I think it's again changing. So um, again, it's a good tool. If we know how to use the tool, we can um, translate that benefit to patient because 
as the programs are accepting, uh, uh, you know, high risk organs and uh, with the higher MFI, I think they need to change some of their immunosuppression strategies. So, so it's really, again, I think this, this is discussed a lot um, in our HLA meeting and, um, you know, we, we have taken some of those high risk donors with high MFIs and really all we did was, okay, we know what we are dealing with. This is, this is the beast. Let's uh, be more aggressive with the immunosuppression, with the induction regimen, with the higher level of, you know, uh, medication. So, so it's a helpful tool. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, one other thing I'll, I'll mention, and this is for our U.S. audience, and that is there are some patients who are very difficult to transplant. So we have on occasion dropped antigens. Uh, so if they have, um, let's say, a, a um, HLA-B6 antibody at 3,000, we will drop that uh, in order to invite organ offers and then see what their cross match looks like and see if we can desensitize them, you know, um, uh, as, as we get them in. Um, so all sorts of these little permutations need to be done, but this is what becomes very pertinent in the very highly sensitized patients. And I think this used to be more of an issue five, six, seven years ago, but with the latest KAS, now kidney allocation system, um, since the highest, um, um, PRA, uh, CPRA patients are given national sharing priority. Uh, we've transplanted a lot of those um, and, you know, with great success. All right. So just uh, to recap, HLA antibody, we can use screening tools or we can use specificity determining tools. Screening tools are PRA or CPRA, which is calculated off of it. Uh, ELISA with an HLA1 slash HLA2 or the flow PRA methodology or even the Luminix methodology with the um, just the HLA and HLA2 beads, or specificity determining um, uh, uh, mechanisms, which I, I think the one that is uh, most commonly used today is single antigen bead. It has completely eclipsed out uh, the ELISA. So now you have the donor and recipient tissue type and you have the recipient antibody profile, it should be transplant. One more step to go. So cross match is still done and we still in most cases, and one of the hospitals that we uh, we uh, do transplants, we have a no cr final cross match protocol for somebody who's got zero PRA. So on on flow PRA or on Luminex screen, they have no class one or class two antibody and have not had any disease, uh, any sensitizing events, and we'll talk about those in a in a little bit. We actually do the transplant without final cross match. Uh, because their risk of rejection is very low. But for everybody else, for all mortals, we would still do cross match. This is the CDC cross match, the Patel and Tarasaki cross match that they described in their paper in 1969. You've got lymphocytes, you incubate it with serum. If you've got the HLA antigen of interest on top of that lymphocyte, the antibody will stick to it. You send in complement, it will kill them. So if you don't have um, antigen, the cell would be viable when you look at it under the microscope. If you do have the antigen of interest, the cell will die. And we'll talk about these improvements in cross match as we go along in the talk, but this is where we start building the picture from. So this is uh, the uh, classic CDC test, and this is what they look like under the microscope. If you've got very few cells that have died, we are very happy. We say this looks good. On the other hand, if all of the cells are dead, we say it looks bad. And we report it on a grade of one to eight. And eight means more than 80% of the cells are dead. One means only less than 10% are dead. Anything above 20% is considered a positive cross match. But this is the most archaic cross match. We don't use this anymore. And what could be the issues? This goes too much into the bowels of HLA things. But, um, you know, you can have aggregation of IgM, you uh, can, you know, chemically inactivate it, heat inactivate it, dialyze it out. So IgMs are of uh, just a nuisance value. They're not pathogenic and we have to get them out of there. So usually now what we do is use DTT or DET and that takes them off. Uh, complement issues. So if there's anti-complement um, issues on the uh, anti-complement uh, proteins, on the like DAF and uh, CD55 and all that on the cell surface. And what we do is we wash it. So the Amos 3 wash or 
methodology was meant to uh, take away the complement issues, which decreases the false negativity. Uh, and then um, uh, we improve the sensitivity of detection because you can imagine that if your uh, antibodies are not fixing complement, they're not going to be able to kill. And so what we did was to improve this. So what we do now is we have the donor lymphocyte, we um, incubate it with the recipient serum. So the antibodies will stick to it if there's antibodies in the serum. Then we wash it and add anti-human globulin. So what the anti-human globulin does is it joins these stuck antibodies on the cell surface if they are weak in fixing complement. And this then helps this to, to um, uh, kill the cell by fixing complement and report it correctly as a positive test. So this is the test that we do now most commonly um, as the baseline test, the AHGCDC. And if your AHGCDC is positive, that means there's a lot of complement fixing antibody, um, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of uh, donor specific antibody in the serum and we better not cross it. Flow cytometric cross match is um, a further development on that. Now you got the donor lymphocyte, same deal. You incubate it with um, with um, the donor, uh, sorry, the recipient serum. If the recipient serum has antibody against the donor lymphocyte, that would stick to it. Then you send in a reporter molecule, so anti-human globulin molecule with a reporter uh, um, 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 a fluorescent molecule on top of it. And then you run it through the flow cytometer. And if all the cells are the same, that is they don't have antibodies stuck to it, this is what your uh, flow cytometry report curve would look like. But if there's a lot of cells with antibodies stuck on it, the fluorescence pattern will change. And this is what your report would look like. So if you're cross match is here, we'll say the mean channel shift is very low. We are happy, oops, excuse me. But if the, if the mean channel shift moves, so this is now uh, 300, we say, oh, we don't like this because the cross match has moved to a mean channel shift of 300 from 50, which should be normal. So we say, ah, this is a very positive cross match. So now we've got a cross back, a and a flow side match. I forgot something. They gate it uh, for CD3 or CD20 so you can differentiate T and B cells as well. So now you've got a T cell cross match which is negative, B cell cross match which is negative. What could be the interpretation for that? It's a true negative which is the usual situation. Or there could be very low level antibody and so sometimes you have nasty uh, anamnestic responses. Um, a few um, um, uh, weeks after transplant, and that is because our, our, our um, tests missed a very low uh, level antibody, and there was an anamnestic response leading to an antibody um, um, mediated rejection, or the antibody was not fixing complement. Uh, T cell cross match is positive, B cell cross match is positive. We are very worried. This is not good. Either the, there's class one antibody or both class one or class two antibody. Now remember, class one antigen is present on both B and T cells. Class two antigen is present only on B cells. Now what happens if your T cell is negative and the B cell is positive, which could mean it's just class two antibody. Uh, it could mean that there's a low level class one antibody. Most people feel that the density of class one ant uh, antigens on um, B cells is more than on T cells. Or, or it could be a false positive B cell cross match. Now remember that FC receptors, which bind antibodies by their FC tail, as well as CD20, which is the target of rituximab, uh, for instance, are all present on B cells. They're not present on T cells. So there's a lot of things that can interfere with a B cell cross match compared to what could interfere with a T cell cross match, which can happen. So if you've got a positive T cell cross match and a completely negative B cell cross match, um, then there's only two possibilities. Usually it's a laboratory, you rerun it, make sure that your quality control is correct, or the B cell cross match is a false negative because your specimen didn't have enough viable B cells. So this is how you kind of ballpark what's going on with this. And obviously you've got donor specific antibody results available to help with that. And we'll kind of go over that exercise in a little bit. So again, this is from one of the labs, hormone lab maybe. 
and they're they're actually uh, telling us that the T cell and B cell cross matches are negative. And based on the methodology that they're describing, this is an AHG CDC. Um, so this is again from uh, a uh, DNA clinical lab. Uh, and I couldn't figure out what their methodology was. So they're describing T cell routine cross match, which I trust is a generic CDC cross match, which probably doesn't need to be done. A T cell AG cross match, which is negative, which is good. A B cell cross match IgM, which probably is getting rid of, is running an auto cross match to get rid of the IgM effect. And B cell cross match IgG, uh, which probably is an AG CDC B cell cross match, which is negative as well. So their methodology is not clear, but they're describing what's happening. Like, um, then uh, this is from the armed forces. Um, if you're not speaking, if you could mute yourself, please. Uh, all right. So this is from AFIP. Um, they have the uh, donor uh, genotype based on an SSP um, platform. So they are doing just low resolution, uh, two digit uh, allelic, uh, sorry, antigenic description. Um, and they have done only six antigens. Um, so here their cross matches are negative um, and um, the, uh, the cross matches are T and B. Uh, but just uh, suppose that this patient had a transplant and a few days later had an acute antibody mediated rejection and the antibody uh, profile at that point revealed a DQ5 antibody at 15,000 MFI. Would that be a DSA? It would be hard to tell. So that is the time when you may want to go back and request them to do um, um, a more detailed uh, genotypic analysis on the donor to help you adjudicate whether this is a um, um, antibody of interest or not. So there's a technique called Luminix DSA and I wouldn't have talked about it, but I found a report about this. So I'm going to talk about it. So this test came out almost 10 years ago. The first paper that came out on this was in 2008 or 2009, something like that. And this is, um, so the pictures I have are from an ELISA platform. So um, just assume that instead of the ELISA plate here, you've got, oops, excuse me, you've got um, micro beads because now it's done on the Luminex platform. So what they do here is they've got beads with HLA anti antibody specificities on them. And so these are either class one or class two and they treat it with the patient's serum. If the patient's serum has uh, the appropriate um, antigens, so they will stick to them. So now you've got the, 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 the perfect you know, receptacle um, to, to check for check for antibody. So now what you do is you send out the serum of interest. If that serum of interest has antibodies against class one or class two antigens, those antibodies would stick. Non-HLA antibodies as well as antibodies that are not donor specific will not stick. And then you can send in a reporter molecule and run it through the Luminix system. And if you see um, fluorescent activity, then you know that there's class one or class two antibodies there, which will tell you um, um, uh, useful information. So um, the problem is that when they actually looked at how this test performed in the real world, it had reasonable, decent sensitivity for class one antigens. It had really bad sensitivity for class two. So most of the people, even the people who described the initial validating data, in their results, they said, uh, maybe you should not use this test on its own, which is their way of saying, maybe it doesn't work that well. Um, so this is a report I got from one of the labs, which are doing a Luminix DSA cross match. I went through their methodology. This is the Luminix DSA methodology that we just discussed. Um, and so their comments is, uh, comments are that Luminix DSA cross match is considered an ideal test to detect HLA antibody, I would differ a little bit respectfully with that assertion. Um, actually, um, most people agree that on its own, this test is not um, entirely useful. So I wouldn't use this Luminix DSA cross match. There is a twist on the Luminix DSA cross match, which is being uh, worked on in Stanford and several other HLA labs in the country. 
which is the immunocomplex uh, capture fluorescence assay, ICFA, which is also known as DSA flow cross match um, to make things more complicated. And the, the twist in this is that they have the, the donor lymphocytes uh, with the ant uh, antigen of interest. They incubate it with uh, uh, recipient serum. If the recipient serum has appropriate antibody, it will attach to the donor lymphocyte. <clears throat> they will then attach, uh, incubate it with the reporter molecule. And now you will have the donor lymphocyte with the antigen, the donor specific antibody, and the anti-human globulin with the reporter molecule. They will then lyse the lymphocyte and stick this complex on a bead and run it through a flow cytometer. And that is supposed to be a much more reliable um, way to do this for both class one and class two antigens, um, as well as uh, in circumstances where you're expecting interference. So here they have put in, and this is the same paper which came out about six months ago or so, uh, you've got um, a, um, a serum with no class one or class two antibody. And when you run it through the flow cytometer, there's no activity in class two, no activity in class one, and your histograms for class two and class two are within the negative cutoff range. Now, if you have class one antibody present in the serum, your class two here will remain where it should, but the activity would move to the right in class one as it should, because now it's reporting the class one antibody, the histogram is moved. So you've got mean channel shift here, and the class two histogram has not moved. Mutatis mutandis, you've got a class two antibody here, the class two will move. And if you've got both types of antibodies, both would move out. So this again, I have never actually, uh, once or twice I've applied this um, in settings where we were not sure on the, um, on the meaning of a particularly positive uh, flow cytometric cross match which we were not expecting, but this is something that is clearly going to come out and maybe improves the way we adjudicate some of these very difficult cases. All right, so uh, this is, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, just a little cartoon telling us where we are. So we're kind of moving in, in this zone now, so this is good, uh, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But for the clinician, it is not that complicated when you're dealing with live donor kidney transplants. So you've got HLA donor typing, you've got recipient ty typing as well as the antibody profile, you get a cross match. And now you have to assess the only question you're answering in a live donor transplant here is what is the early AMR risk and what is the late AMR risk, right? So the AMR risk, we all would agree, if you've got negative single antigen bead, negative cross match, the risk is low, we'll proceed. This is the fairly big majority of patients. If both of those are positive, we know that there is a problem. We would want to stop there. If there's discordance, which means the single antigen bead is positive, so there's a donor specific antibody maybe, um, but the cross match is negative. So what is that antibody doing? or there's no antibody being detected, but the cross match is positive. So that means either this is a false negative or this is a false positive, or there's an antibody that we have not detected. What do you do? This is where a conversation between the transplant nephrologist and the HLA lab is very important. So let's look at the first um, set of uncertainty circumstances. You've got an antibody there, but the cross match is negative. And the question you're asking yourself and the HLA lab director is, is this something that I need to worry about? You ACID treat it. When we ACID treat it, it denatures all, H, um, all HLA on all beads. If the DSA is still registering, that means the antibody is toggling denatured HLA on beads. That's something that happens with on a not infrequent basis, but our HLA labs, at least in the US, are very good about it. They will do it automatically. And then they'll tell us, yeah, don't worry about it. That was just a, a bad run on the SAB. There's no antibody. We're good. <clears throat> um, there could be a DSA with low expression or avidity. And this is where the transplant nephrologist will have to make a determination. The cross match is completely negative. You've got a little bit of a B antibody, let's say B5 at um, an MFI of, um, you know, 1800, is this relevant or not? And this is where you make a clinical decision. You look at the patient, you look at the antibody, you look at their um, history and you say, okay, 
I can eat this, I can do this, but you need to realize that you're going to have about a 20% AMR range, even in these low um, antibody levels. And class two antibodies, you can run into chronic allograft nephropathy issues. I transplant these people. So if I see a low level antibody, cross match is completely negative. And I know that the patient has the wherewithal. If it's an elderly patient, very sick, I might think about it. But a younger patient where I know that the chance of antibody-mediated rejection is offset by the benefit that they'll get from transplantation. And if it comes to this, I can treat them out of, um, of an acute antibody-mediated rejection. I would take them. And then other lab factors that we talked about, which lead to false positive single antigen beads. Uh, we discussed them with, uh, with um, the lab and try to figure this out. So the only place where you run into a little bit of trouble is trying to decide whether a low level antibody is clinically relevant or not. What if your antibody screen is completely negative, but the flow cytometric cross match is positive? Okay, so the first thing you wanna do is have the lab run an auto flow cross match to make sure there's no auto antibodies, which will kind of resolve the situation. You do Serial dilutions, this is very important. Make sure if you're running into this situation, make the lab do serial dilutions because sometimes um, there will be what is known as the prozone phenomenon. So um, those of us who uh, are as old as I would remember the veal Felix re re um, reaction. And I'll quiz you on that later. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and you know, you could get sometimes very high level of antibody, which would be negative in neat um, uh, serum, but as you diluted the serum out, it will suddenly appear. And what seems to happen is that very high antibody level, especially when there's some IgM in there as well and some complement as well, it actually prevents um, the antibody from binding the beads. But when you start diluting it out, the antibody can actually muscle its way in and start getting onto its beads. So if you're getting that situation where your neat serum is negative on the sab, but diluted, you know, when you've done a one to four or one to eight dilution and suddenly you start seeing antibody, that means there's a very high well of antibody and the flow cytometric cross match is indeed a true positive. So be wary in that situation. Also, we talked about you're, you're, you're getting a flow cytometric cross match, but you're saying there's no donor specific antibody. The reason that is you're not really donor type. You don't have DP, you don't have full DQ, you don't have full DR, or they've not done a good job and you're looking at a couple of blanks where there's probably a um, HLA antigen of uh, significance, which was not picked up by the uh, molecular method that they were utilizing. So that's where you want to get precision typing. And if that is the case, then you actually have a true S uh, donor specific antibody as well as a flow cytometric cross match. Similarly with Craig's, you need to talk about it and they would confer risk. Or you can run a situation where cross match is being on uh, HLA antibody. So we ran into this situation a little while ago. We had somebody with uh, NCA associated vasculitis who had been treated with rituximab and their B cell cross match was persistently very high and very positive. And we realized it was just rituximab running around in the blood. So we did a prozone um, um, uh, treatment for that, which throws, a, throws off the uh, rituximab from the cell surface and the and the, uh, and the, um, and the um, uh, cross match became negative and we were able to transplant without a problem. But this has to be assessed. And now all of these, we are transplant nephrologists, we are not HLA techs, but we need to know all of this so that we can make sure that our HLA people are doing a good job. Because in the end, if we make a mistake, the HLA people are gonna go like this and it's our patient and we'll be left with treating um, rejections or allograft loss, et cetera. So um, finally, how to navigate this in Pakistan. We are dealing with just live donors in Pakistan. So the first thing you wanna do is to assess LO immune risk. If they've had a previous transplant, if they've had pregnancies, multiple pregnancies especially, which unfortunately is not uncommon, uh, multiple transfusions, then I would put them in a high risk bucket. Now, and you know, this is something where we can discuss and you have to tell me um, based on cost and everything in these particular situations, when, when I know that there's a high likelihood that there would be some sensitization, I would do an AHG CDC cross match as well as a flow cytometric cross match, and I would run their single beads. And if both are negative, the cross matches are negative, the beads are negative, we would proceed. Obviously, if there's discordance, we'll discuss. If they're both positive, then we stop. 
if the allomune risk is low, we can just do an AGCDC crossmatch and a flow cytometric crossmatch. I would be, you know, almost ready to proceed without um, an antibody profile um, if these are completely negative. But based on cost, you can run a flow PRA and get an idea if there's any type of HLA antibody in there or not. And uh, if the flow PRA is negative, the HGCDC is negative, and the cross flow cytometric cross match is negative, you can proceed. And you can do this as simple as this. As long as you know what you're doing, and as long as you know that your lab is doing a good job, because you will be completely blind and you'll run into trouble if um, your lab is giving you something which you think is one thing, but they've done something differently. So you need to have a very clear conversation with your lab directors to make exactly sure what they're doing, what they're reporting, and what inference you can draw from there. So I will stop here and I will welcome any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aga. Uh, this is Dr. Salan from Lahore. Um, anybody, everybody can hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for uh, squeezing such a vast topic in such a short period of time. It was awesome. Um, and um, I, I, I just, uh, I think we have, uh, must have a lot of questions. I would like to ask uh, actually, um, you know, people from SIUT uh, first, Dr. Ali, um, if, uh, you know, if he has any questions, uh, you know, and then I, I think we can leave the forum open for further questions. I have a few questions myself as well. Uh, Dr. Ali, uh, do you, uh, do, would you like to pitch in and have some questions about it? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, the best people to uh, pose any questions or answer them would be Dr. Khamar Abbas and Dr. Tahir Aziz. They both are here. Dr. Khamar is the head of our immunology lab and Dr. Tahir Aziz is the head of our transplant department. Excellent. So we'll learn from the immunology lab people together because none of us are immunologists. We pretend to be those as um, transplant nephrologists, but this is very, very technical now. And you really need good immunology people helping us uh, for, for all these issues. So I look forward to their comments and how things are on ground in Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Kavar, would you like to take over? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Ali. Yes, Dr. Khawar, please go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a very nice and elegant talk. Uh, in SIUT, uh, we are doing CDC cross match, enhanced anti human glob globulin cross match, and uh, we discriminate between IgG and IgM by doing DTT cross match. If the, if the CDC cross match is positive, we exclude autoantibodies by doing the auto cross match. And we also do flow cross match, T and B cells, IgG and IgN, and Luminex antibody screen. If the screen is positive, then we go for the single antigen class one or class two. Then we stratify our risk. If all cross match is negative, then we go ahead for transplant. If the, if the Luminex is positive, or if CDC is positive, then we stratify the risk and uh, modulate the, our immunosuppression protocols, where either the, this patient is induced, what is the immunosuppression protocols. And if, the, if three cross match is positive, for example, if CDC is positive, then we do the titration, dilution of the cross match. So the, this is our protocols. That's very comprehensive. That actually makes all of your patients fall in this bucket. And so if you're screening them like this, you're doing a very comprehensive job. That, that's what we do here in the US. So that's state of the art uh, for clinical practice. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, Dr. Tahir, maybe you want to tell us uh, for the high risk patients, uh, what kind of immune suppression do we use if the cross match is positive? or someone with an antibody mediated re rejection uh, has a donor specific antibody, then how do we treat them? Can I answer this? Sure, sure, Dr. Khan. For highly sensitized, yeah. For highly sensitized means 
positive for CDC, positive for flu, and positive for luminex. Donor specific antibodies are there. So we have a protocols. We first immunize them, titer them. If if the patient has a very high titer of antibodies, for example, one is to 128 or one is to uh, double. So we cannot consider for desensitizations. Uh, we take about one is to eight, one is to 16 for desensitization. And first uh, we immunize them for pneumococcal and hemophilus influenza vaccines and uh, uh, give rotaximab single dose plasma phrases, uh, high dose IV, low dose IVIG initially and in the, at the end of the protocol give high dose IVIG uh, and after transplant single dose of high dose IVIG and one cycle of bortezomib. So this is our the desensitization protocol and the day of transplant CDC cross match must be negative. Yeah, I think so uh, how many patients do you do use uh, this desensitization protocol maybe in a month or um, uh, like, like I'm just trying to assess like uh, how often do you have to do this? Uh, yes, we use very frequently uh, because we uh, stratify our patients. For example, if a patient is positive for on three assays, so the protocol is different. If patient is positive on two assays for single antigen beads and flow, the protocol is different. And if patient is positive only on Luminex, so the protocol is different. So these are the three categories to stratify our immunosuppressions protocol. Uh, out of interest, what is your AMR, what is your AMR rate after desensitization in these patients whose AHG CDC is positive and you're desensitizing to that? Yeah, it's yes, it's it depends on the. For example, if the patient is positive on three assays. So our AMR is 25% on three assays after doing all these. And patients, uh, and if, if, if patients who are positive on single antigen beads, negative on CDC and flu, so AMR, our AMR is 11% on these patients. And patients who are positive on CDC, on Lomenex and flu, our AMR is 16%. Now, those, those, those are pretty good numbers, uh, especially for the triple positive patients. Um, usually, um, <clears throat> if your AHG CDC is positive and the antibody well is very high, very deep, um, it's sometimes considered a, um, a, a proposition of diminishing returns because the AMR and then chronic AMR um, rates are very high. But in the U.S., we have the, um, the options of going into KBD programs. Um, in Pakistan, I think there's um, some legislation that has been passed, legislation that has been passed that um, only related donors can donate now, and that kind of makes KBD difficult. So if you don't have an alternate donor, then you have to make that donor work. Um, and so under those circumstances, I can understand your constraints and the need to go through very drastic immunosuppressive uh, protocols. But I worry just a little bit because of the infection milieu in Pakistan and all that, but I'm sure you're watching all that and the, the antibody re mediated rejection results yes. are in, a, in an acceptable range. So that's not too bad. Uh, Irfan, just one point, Dr. Adil here from PKLI. Uh, we are working very closely with the organ authority in Pakistan with Punjab mm -hmm. and the almost the paired kidney exchange program is almost approved and there is going to be a letter very soon from the DG and for such patients which Khawar has described, I think they can all enter into the paired kidney exchange and we can find a compatible donor. This will work for an ABU incompatible and this will work for an uh, these uh, also cross match positive or the slash HLA incompatible transplants. No, I think I think that is the way to go because you know um, uh, in Pakistan uh, the only mode of transplantation is living donor transplant. Uh, you know, barring uh, very few examples here and there, so it is almost insane not to allow you to do KPD uh, because just the amount of cost that goes into desensitization, 
and the peril that you put the recipient into by giving them this monstrosity of immunosuppression that we have to do uh, can be easily sidestepped by, by doing a peer donation, um, which, would, which would work just as well and, um, and uh, would relieve the financial burden as well as the, um, the real cancer and infection burden on these recipients. So I think everybody um, who's involved in kidney transplantation must, uh, must lobby uh, to repeal that stupid law and to get KPD uh, approved uh, in the country and then run it well. So you'll have to streamline um, your labs. You'll have to streamline your methodology. So, you know, we looked at five or six different labs and each one of them are doing their own thing um, when you're doing KPD, um, you might run into this. Uh, one HLA is high resolution, the other one is not. Uh, antibodies are being done through different methodologies. So you'll have to make all of that uniform. And you know, it looks like there's people from all big towns on this call. So you should all sit down together. And we are happy to help uh, because uh, um, you know, I've been involved for almost 10 years now when I was in San Antonio with the largest KPD program in the country. Uh, actually in the world, I think, uh, barring Korea. Um, and uh, so we developed it from zero to where KPDs were 70 or 80 transplants a year. Um, so it can be done. Uh, it is not hard to do. And I'm really encouraged to look at the degree of resources that you already have. You've got the best, you know, some of the labs are doing as good work as any lab in the U.S. is doing. So what you need to do is to get in touch with those labs that are doing good work, those HLA directors who are willing to work with you because when you are going out and devising these chains and pairs and all that, you have to be very judicious, you have to be very careful. And um, there's many different things that you can do to increase uh, live donor transplantation, um, decrease the number of desensitizations. I can't remember the last time I desensitized anybody to be honest. We are forgetting how to do that because we're able to swap them off, which is much, much easier and much better for everybody involved. So that needs to happen. I mean, you guys should all clamor for this rule to go and then very carefully because the worst thing that can happen is you start a program uh, without well, uh, planning it well, and then you have a couple of accidents and then the whole thing will die off because people will say, oh, this is not going to work. So you have to develop a good program a priori so that um, the confidence in your referring nephrologists and in the general population builds up. Yeah, so maybe uh, if I can add something, um, I, I think, um, you know, since, this, since we're talking about a lot of, you know, this is solution focused uh, discussion, um, just to uh, uh, let everybody know that uh, this kidney pair donor exchange and how the algorithm uh, was devised. And so Alvin Roth, who is an economist, he got Nobel Prize for really helping us to uh, do this matching algorithm for the kidney, uh, the spare donor exchange. So I think if uh, um, you are heading towards that direction, uh, it would be, I, I think it needs a national level collaboration uh, to make it very, very successful. Because I think in USA, we do have a nonprofit organization um, who have uh, really, you know, helped to uh, invigorate a lot of those uh, chains. So uh, several patients, so very large chains of the, these pair donor exchanges. But I think the work people from economy have done work to, to win even the Nobel Prize to help us to uh, do these uh, pair donor exchanges. May I respond to this? Um... We have done uh, these swaps at SIUT. We have done, I think, about eight or 10 pairs. Um, the, the science of paired kidney transplant may be easier to tackle. It's the social issues that are related to this paired kidney are very difficult. You see, what uh, the, the problem is that if you do a swap, then both the transplants have to be done on the same day uh because uh, if uh, if god forbid what happens is that if the one one donors uh, one recipient did not uh, uh, get a good immediate result 
they may uh, blame the doctors that you know you, we were cheated or you uh, you gave us the bad kidney and uh, uh, and all kind of these things even though we spend so much time in explaining all these procedures to them and telling them so that acceptable acceptability of the community i think that comes first and for the speed uh, kidney transplant we also have that iranian model where the government works as the catalyst and uh, it's only done in the government hospitals and they don't only uh, swap uh, one to one they they may swap like three or four pairs you know uh, and uh, the government was also subsidizing the cost of transplant and also reimbursing incentivizing the donors so then all that organ commerce got uh, involved and it became a trade and all the vulnerable people who are really poor would come forward to become a donor because they would get an incentive of money our community our society is so vulnerable for all this so that is why the swap program has not picked up really so much at SIUT that we're very, very selective in choosing the two pairs that we want to swap, uh, swap the kidneys for. No, for sure. I mean, uh, when we started KPD in the United States, this was our concern as well. Um, we wanted to have um, both the donors to undergo surgery simultaneously because we were worried that, you know, one may get the surgery and the other guy may back out that, you know, my recipient has already got the kidney, I'm out of here. But that almost never happens. I mean, some, I mean, we, we've done chains of 20s and 25. I think the largest we did was 27 transplants in a week. And so somebody whose recipient got a kidney on Friday, they donated the next Friday. Uh, and nobody backs out. The only time we can sometimes run into trouble, and there's papers on this, on donor back out. Um, you know, if a health issue happens that, you know, there was a guy, 50 year old donor waiting to donate, now he has an MI. I mean, what do you do with that? So sometimes the chains break like that. But there's various ways in which this thing works in the US. Um, but that does work because we, all of us take this responsibility very, very seriously, and we are the custodians of the program. So every nephrologist who's dealing with this will have to take ownership and not let expedience take over. You have to protect the program, you have to protect the sanctity of the program because if one person malfunctions in that, the entire program would go down. Um, so this, as uh, Umar said, this has to be a multi-city, um, this could be, not has to be, but this could be a multi-city national initiative where selected hospitals can um, can uh, be designated. Um, I, I, I think the uh, Pakistan Armed Forces are uniquely in a position to in a pilot a program like this because they've got very good labs and they've got very good hospitals which can do transplantation in multiple areas. They've got the means to ship kidneys. The Air Force can ferry, uh, ferry uh, these kidneys in their Bombay's um, um, in jets. Um, that's their flying training time or whatever they do. Uh, and so it can actually work in the armed forces better than any place else. And there's a lot of discipline in the armed forces uh, and there's no primary gain for the physicians. They're working in a system so they can pilot a program and then the civilian side can build on it, but the civilian side can show the way as well. Uh, this does require a lot of education. Dr. Lane Mala is 100% correct because people are going to be worried that you're going to take my guy's good kidney and give me a bad kidney in return. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's this trust that needs to be built. So we sometimes use compatible pairs to act as accelerators for chains. So you have a compatible pair who could donate to each other, but their phenotype is such that they could actually initiate a chain and we've used them and we want to make certain that they're compensated. So we compensate them by getting them a better matched kidney or a younger kidney. Um, and so it works. And a lot of our chains today 
are run through compatible pairs, but that may be a very difficult step to take in Pakistan. So the first thing you want to do is to start a pilot program, build it up, make sure that your HLA labs are equipped, make sure that your pathology is, uh, and, and your ORs are equipped, because you're having three or four transplant surgeries back to back. I think big institutions like SIUT or uh, the, the bigger hospitals in, um, in other big cities can deal with that. Smaller hospitals, probably not so much. So you have to capacity build. You have to stand up all the ancillary services. You have to train a lot of people, uh, including your coordinators or, or ancillary staff who talk to, talk to these patients and then start rolling the program out. You can't roll the program out and then talk about training them later. That would lead to, lead to failure, I think. So no, I think that's something that has been um, on, the, on the back of my mind for Pakistan for a long period of time. Um, and the only thing that um, has stopped me from initiating that is because I'm not there. Um, you have to be there. And then I heard about the laws that were barring this, which in my mind is, very short-sighted, and I don't know what the background for those laws is, but um, I think if there's meeting of the minds and nephrologists in every big town are willing to do this, you can actually start within one town. So all the people in Lahore can come together and say, we're going to develop a KBD program in Lahore, and there can be a KBD program in Karachi and a KBD program in Peshawar. And then you can you know, see if you can take it to the next level because the logistics when you're dealing with something like this between two towns become tougher, um, how to fly kidneys and so on and so forth. And again, I think the armed forces are uniquely in a position to do this um, um, themselves uh, and they can actually pilot a national program because they've got those resources uh, that you would require uh, for something like this. That's, that's absolutely right, Dr. Aga. Actually, um, yeah, that's been a wish actually so far. Uh, in the interest of time, I would just like to uh, sort of ask, uh, you know, as I had mentioned to you earlier, there have been uh, programs which are like university-based, like, you know, institution-based, like PKLI, SIUT, they're, they're doing an amazing job. I mean, the number of transplants that SIUT does, PKLI has been doing, has been amazing. Uh, the problem lies in the private sector. Like, you know, I mean, when I moved back to Lahore, I mean, and uh, and the problems that I went through, basically, I mean, that was like, I mean, I, I can't describe because there are no protocols. You have to make your own protocols. It's a patient to patient variation. Um, I just want to ask one question, actually, uh, we are running out of time, basically, but for the most part, um, let me tell you, in the private setups, the transplants, the low risk transplants, as you had mentioned in this last uh, slide, uh, we do an AAG CDC cross match and the typing and we proceed with the transplant. Uh, do you think it's absolutely necessary to consider the flows if it's a low risk and if the CDC augmented CDC is okay? Um, just, just to comment on that, uh, you know, and uh, you know, for a little bit, uh, you know, I mean, honestly, last two transplant patients that came to me after getting a transplant with the second transplants with, you know, uh, you know, multiple butt transfusion and the second transplants. Their cross match was done six months ago. The guy got transplanted uh, at a private hospital and comes to me, surprising with the credit of 0 0.7, doing amazing. I was just, you know, uh, shocked to see, I mean, the way it's being done in a private sector. But again, it, 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 it varies from, you know, center to center. So we don't have the luxury of established protocols, things. We have to facilitate the patient. We can't say you should go and get this, you know, PR in a low risk that's going to add like a uh, hundred thousand rupees because, you know, I mean, they're, you know, honestly, they are getting the donations from other people to get through the, you know, the transplant procedure. I mean, they can't afford that much. They're already, you know, in big trouble, uh, you know, selling their, you know, whatever, you know, assets they have. So uh, that becomes a problem. So if you can just comment on just that low risk, somebody who is coming in for the first one, not too high of a risk, not many transfusions or rather none, can we just go by with simple procedure like that in a private setup? So far we've been doing it, we've been doing fine. I think Ahad can comment on that further, but I mean, we have not had such a big problem so far because we don't have the luxury of all those things. Yeah, so I mean, if you don't have antibody profile um, and the only thing you're doing in AFG CDC and you're proceeding with a cross match, you are going to eat some rejection. Uh, again, <clears throat> 
this, you know, most people are probably going to be okay, but there would be some which will run into trouble. So you have to just be cognizant of the amount of risk you're willing to take with a live donor transplant. So if I were in your shoes uh, for the low risk people, I would do an AHG CDC and a flow cytometric cross match, but I would forego antibody detection mechanisms as long as the, the, the cross matches were completely negative. Um, that's one. The second thing is, as professionals um, in this highly specialized field, I think somebody in Pakistan, you know, I don't know who that authority is these days because they keep putting in and putting out PMDC. So I don't know if they're in or out now, uh, but whoever is monitoring what doctors do, somebody needs to define um, what needs to happen at a minimum level for some patients. So there needs to be some, some, some uh, practice guidelines which need to be adhered to when you're doing kidney transplantation. Uh, if people are not going to follow those, and you know, I've seen that, you know, this was a long time ago where urologists used to do kidney transplants and they would show them the urine bag on the first day, look, the kidney is working, you're making urine. And then they would vanish and three months later, the patient would be back on dialysis or five months later, the patient would, would be back on dialysis. So we don't want that happening. So you're exactly right. It's very frustrating, I'm sure, as a clinician where you see somebody, I'm glad that the patient you picked up was okay, but the reason you didn't see the one um, who, um, who didn't show up was because they had a bad outcome maybe. So there would be people, this is a law of large numbers. Eventually you will, bad outcomes will catch up in a situation like this. So Einstein said that make th things as simple as you can, but not simpler. So I would probably, and you know, there's many transplant nephrologists on the line. My personal uh, line would be that I want to make absolutely certain that cross matches at a very sensitive level are negative. And if they are, I would then forego the antibody studies because I understand a flow PRA or a SAB runs north of a thousand, a hundred thousand rupees. Is that right, Ursula? Yes. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I, I can imagine that, that for most people that would be not um, affordable. And if they cost about the same, then if you have to do a SAB test, uh, if you have to do an antibody test, just do the SAB and you get all the information you need rather than doing one test for screening and then another test for beads. So if, if you've got to pick between the two, don't screen, just do, do the SAB. The screens you do for low risk people. So if the low risk guy, you want it to be 100% um, sure that there's no alloimmune risk, then you would do a flow PRA here. Uh, but in this particular situation, if you're if a resource constraint, uh, constrained, then just do the cross match and proceed. Um, but if people are cutting a lot of corners, there needs to be a way to protect patients against um, what would be considered standard of care uh, or treatment, which is against or below the standard of care. And I would actually, this is, you know, some, this is something that we don't even think about here, you know, so it's, it's hard for me to square this, but you guys, uh, you know, you're, you're very experienced nephrologists who've done this for a long time in Pakistan. Um, enlighten us how you have never, how you have this, because I want, discussion. Um, you guys what risk is is uh, acceptable to you. So, uh, you know, um, please enlighten us uh, how you've done this in, in Pakistan. Maybe Dr. Khabar has been with SIUT for more than 25 years and he has seen the evolution. Yeah. When uh, they all started doing the transplant, the cyclosporin level was not available, so they used to estimate it by the by a Doppler ultrasound. Dr. Kavar, how do you see this? That how, for those patients, can I can comment on the first questions on the CDC cross patch? Yes, sure, please go ahead. Yeah, there is a there is a very nice study from the Basel, 
uh, I think from the AGT in 2010, they shared, they shared their experience in, I think all patients they transplanted are CDC negative and they retrospectively went back and checked their donor specific antibodies. 67 patients are positive and 50% of the patient experience acute rejection episodes within first three, uh, within first three months. So I think along with, because the CDC is not specific, along with CDC is Luminex is also important. Because after transplant, patient develop antibody mediated rejection, you spend more on treatment. So you screen on first and then you stratify the risk and manage accordingly. I think this comment answers both questions. Oh yeah, I agree. I mean, I mean, exactly. I mean, you know, I think uh, as Dr. Agas said, I think uh, it would be great if, you know, the local uh, docs, the nephrologist could just set some local standards, the bare minimum to meet. I think that would be awesome to, you know, to follow. And, but I'm not sure exactly if it's gonna be possible because there is no national strategy. There is no local strategy. The HOTA, the Whole Human Organ Transplant Authority has no transplant nephrologist, not that I'm aware of. I mean, there is nothing to guide and everybody other than the people in the big institutions, you know, SIUT does it for free. PKLI, probably Dr. Adil can comment. It's like 26 to 28 lakh rupees a transplant. I mean, we are doing it in nine lakh rupees. Uh, you know, uh, people on dialysis, they die. Uh, I mean, you know, and we need to get them, you know, through this procedure with, you know, whatever the resources they have. For the most part, we, you know, we try to induce them with Thymo and try to get them some time as much as we can. But, you know, we try to, and the surveillance is, I mean, I'm not sure exactly, but in, in this, um, uh, in this open market world, it's, it's pathetic. I mean, patients don't even follow up at times. You know, so yes. they're on their own. I mean, you know, there's no comprehensive program that's gonna ask them, call them, check on them, get their labs, sync with the nephrologist and all that. So that's, that's not happening over here. So I, I'm looking at 30 people who were on this call who are practicing yeah. transplantation in Pakistan. Some of them are, most of them are. I think you're it, you're the committee. Uh, you guys need to force this agenda. Um, I think you guys have to go out to bat for the patients. The government is never going to, they don't even know what these issues are. They, you know, they're, they're all busy in dharnas and all that nonsense. So uh, I think what we need to do is to have a, uh, um, a, a movement that is spearheaded by professionals in the field, decide on this is what we are going to request at a minimum. I mean, if you can do SABs and flow cytometric and AIG and everybody, great, but you need to draw a line that what if somebody can't afford it? What is our second line? You know, what is acceptable? I'm sure you'll have to draw a line somewhere. You'll have to draw a line at some point that this, below this, we're not gonna accept this transplant because we are going to endanger this patient. The, the risk of rejection is too high. And so you draw that line and that's where you define the standard of care, desired minimum. And if somebody is doing things below that minimum, then they shouldn't be transplanting because they're endangering patients. That's not good. And that's not good for anybody in the system. So I think this is something, you know, there's people from SIUT here, there's people from Pickley, our salon is there in the, you know, the private, private world trying to, to help these patients out on his own. But all of you need to get together and make sure that you can um, uh, provide uh, what is considered minimally acceptable in taking care of these very, very complicated patients. Um, I mean, this is not a pneumonia we're trying to treat. This is a life altering event. This is very expensive. And the risk of making a mistake is tremendous and tragic. So I think you guys can put your foot down and say, this is how we want to do it. Um, but I don't think um, any government regulatory authority is going to come out and come up with prescient uh, um, issues. This is how you need to lobby. This is how things are done in the United States. If they do something 
which we feel is not good, we raise bloody hell and eventually they change it. Sometimes, sometimes they don't, but sometimes they do. So you have to affect change at a very granular level, at the grassroot level, because you guys are engaged in taking care of these patients in very difficult circumstances. Dialysis is very expensive and it is being subsidized, yes. For the most part, it is being subsidized. So it is in the government's interest to promote transplantation. Um, and so you have to connect the dots for them, but you have to make sure that we are protecting our patients. And I'm sure this is turning into a sermon. I don't mean it to be so. Um, you know, this is, this is a real problem. And, and um, I, I, I think, unfortunately, um, you know, as they say, never send to, know, send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee, my friends. Uh, you have to make this, make this happen. Well, I, I, I would say that uh, I'm sure all of us are motivated by, by your words. And I see that this, there's a lot of passion inside you about those exchanges and, and how you want to you know, implement that. I, I think we, you know, in the end, I mean, we are, it's beyond midnight right now. And I really want to thank everybody on, in Pakistan. Uh, oh my God, if I, may, I just have a very quick question. So, um, so this is Ahad from Lahore. Uh, but sorry, just, uh, I know it's midnight, but uh, just give me a minute. I just need to sort of ask one very, very important question. Uh, so one goes back, oh, the first question goes back to the tissue typing aspect in which you said that, you know, so uh, as you saw, so there is first, there's just the allele and then there's a subtype of the allele. So let's say that A27 is a match, but the sub subtype isn't a match. So should I count that as a mismatch or is that still a match? So that's the first bit. The second part is that let's say uh, in, in the graph that you showed that the way you probably think that Pakistanis need to do it, that you know, uh, Pakistani nephrologists need to do it, that if there's pregnancy, multiple blood transfusions, but there's no mention of any tissue typing there. So maybe it's, it's a stupid question altogether, but would you advocate that we go, go away with all tissue type, ordering tissue typing in the first place, because our subtyping isn't great anyway, and we do the sub and the cross match only in, in, in the you know, sort of uh, resource restraint uh, you know, milieu, as you mentioned earlier. So would you think that sub is more important or the tissue typing is more important? Yeah, so philosophically, antibody profile in kidney, in solid, or if you were doing bone marrow transplantation, the answer would be totally different. In kidney, tra in solid organ transplantation, the antibody profile is very important, but how are you going to interpret if that antibody that you're picking up is of any consequence or not? Because the specificity of that antibody is going to depend on, uh, on, the, on the genotype of your of your donor, right? So you will need some genotype, but what I'm trying to suggest is that rather than spending an arm and a leg on the most expensive and most explicit type of genotype, you could probably do with, you know, molecular method, I'm not trying to say that you go back to ser serology, serology is terrible, but you can do the low resolution molecular typing, which should be cheaper. I don't know how your labs are charging you for all this or charging the patients for all this, but there's, you know, I've, I've put this up. This is a very comprehensive typing uh, with, it, I'm sorry, I'm at the wrong place. But you, you can have a very, very comprehensive four digit or six digit or eight digit type, which is of no use really in kidney transplantation. Um, so, you know, what we get as report from our HLA tap, uh, lab, and we're, we're, we're doing KPDs and uh, desensitizations, we actually get serologic equivalence so that it's easy for us <coughs> to calculate the, the level of mismatch. And if there's an issue, we can then uh, we can then ask for higher level of um, of um, uh, description on that genotype. But the advantage we have is that I can actually go back and ask the lab to do it. I'm not sure if the labs that you're doing uh, are they storing specimens or not. Can they reliably pull the right specimen at that time? So if you're if you're asking, we completely do away with tissue typing. I think that's maybe not going to be useful. Uh, but what you can do is, so I've, I've put in the Al Khan University report here. So this is a molecular 
um, um, me method through which they've, do they've done this report. And they're giving you just antigenic uh, descriptions. And for the most patients whose cross matches are negative and, and the, um, and the um, antibody profile is negative, this is all you need. You don't need to do anything more complicated than this. Now, let's suppose you had an antibody, and I wish I, were, I was good with, uh, with um, uh, splits and, and um, multiple personalities, I call them, of, of these antigens off the top of my head. But let's suppose you had an antibody and you weren't sure if this is you know, DSA or not, or if there's an antibody which is, or if there's no antibody uh, and a cross match is moving, and you're saying, I've not adjudica adjudicated DSA, but the cross match is moving, those are the circumstances where you might want more detailed um, antigenic description. So as long as you can thread that needle, that I can start with a basic screen, but have the ability to go to a more comprehensive screen, should I need it? So look at the screen here. Um, you've got very comprehensive allele level descriptions on multiple alleles, right? Whereas over here, you just have the antigenic descriptions. They're both molecular methods. This should be cheaper than this, but I don't know what they're costing, right? So if they cost the same, I would do this because you now have everything. But if this costs $10 and this costs $5, I'll do this one. This is good enough for most scenarios that you're going to come across. Again, you, you've got the, 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 you know, the, the, um, the ease of operation that you're just doing live donors. You're not doing deceased donors. So you don't have to make a decision whether you want to accept an organ or not with a gun to your head, right? So you've got live donors, you can do a cross match, you can, you know, think about it, you can see what the, the, the descriptions are, uh, and then make, make your call. So I think a lot of this stress, even by the HLA labs, because they're looking at literature, and when you look at HLA literature, they sometimes seamlessly move from bone marrow to solid organ transplant, and carry inferences from one to another, you know, without thinking about what's going to happen in the practical world. I mean, I almost never look at these details very, very rarely, once or twice a year, where I'm like, okay, I really don't know if this antibody is that, 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 what do I do? I'll call the actually direct, Kathy, what can I do with this, right? And she will walk me through, okay, this is an antibody, this is a crack. I don't remember all of that. So they learn to do this. non HLA people in today's time can't operate in this because we don't learn all these numbers. We don't know what splits there are. We don't know which crag this antibody shares. The HLA people have algorithms and they've got software which walks them through it. And so she tells me, okay, this antibody looks like this is what's causing your problem. And then we target that antibody to treat, but that happens once or twice a, day, a year. What is our acute antibody mediated rejection rate? Two to 3%. So two or three out of every 100 transplants, you're gonna have a simple antibody mediated rejection. Out of those, how many gonna be refractory? Maybe one and a half. So in order to track that one and a half percent where you're gonna have a serious problem, you can't spend all that money on a hundred patients, right? So you have to adjudicate that a little carefully of what you really need here. So I think this is too much. Yeah. I would not use this. Yeah. I mean, it's good that you're getting it. And if you're getting it for, for, a, for a good cost, fine. But I can, I can live with much less than this as long as it's a molecular method. And as long as they're giving me reasonable in, in information. And as long as I've got the ability to go back to them and say, okay, can you DP type this for me? Can you run the additional DR typing on this so that I'm sure that the antibody I'm seeing is not actually significant? Does that make sense? Yes. Arslan, can I have one comment? Please, please, please go ahead, Dr. Ajahn. Okay. I just want to clarify that about 92% of the transplants in PKLI free, the rest eight are uh, uh, paying patients. And the cost of the transplant is between 12 to 14 lakh rupees. Uh, the second point, Irfan, I just want to differ with you regarding the algorithm as far as the low risk patients in Pakistan is concerned. You said that if the flow cross match is negative, then you can pro proceed with the transplant. I will say here that except in the haploidentical individuals, I think you need to identify a low level DSA in this patient, especially regarding the A antigen, B antigen, and DR and DQ. C antigen, I don't care much about because of the antigen expression and the DP you already clarified because of the antigen expression, it's not going to turn 
flow cross because to turn a flow cross match positive you need at least an mfi of about 3 to 4000 to turn an dsa into a flow cross positive and arbitrary cdc requires that is 8 to 10000 because if you can identify a dsa at a b or dr or dq at a 2000 for example that will not turn a flow cross match positive but the dsa will be a risk of a preformed ntrd that dsa especially with the class 2 dsa has a risk of a cmr over the long term that craft will survival will be decreased so then i what i why i want to do plus if i want to do anything like iva ivig or anything like rituximab or if there is other do- donor option available then i might need to change the donor and give the patient a dsa free donor that's it no i think i think those are all very good points let me just kind of address the assumption here was that these are all living related transplants because that's what what's happening in pakistan i think uh, what i was led to believe was that living unrelated transplants are not being allowed at this time so that's one the second thing is uh when you have a low level of preformed antibody you do have a heightened risk of acute antibody mediated rejection which is to the tune of about 20% um you can um also be at risk for anamnestic acute antibody mediated rejection which is a very rare event in my career i've seen maybe three or four of them so it's not that everybody is going to run into that situation so you play the odds here so this is not optimal this is you know what you get so it's almost like you know this is this is what is going to be possible um otherwise the option is not to transplant right so again antibody mediated rejection rates in all comers are low um and so the risk is here that as adil says that you are going to miss a low level low mfi antibody which is not moving across match and so there would be some risk for acute antibody mediated rejection but i don't think that's a prohibitive risk as long as you're willing to accept a few of those antibody mediated rejections actually the antibody mediated rejection risk is not zero even with dsas because it depends on where you're fixing your msi mfis i've had an acute antibody mediated rejection where there was a donor specific antibody i forget the antigen but the mfi was in the 900s uh, in a serum sample Three months before the transplant, it was at nine hundred. It would have been flagged as negative uh, in our system as a negative MFI, and it can move it. So these things are real. These things are problems. We are just trying to make things a little bit easy. But un- unfortunately, whenever you miss and whenever you cut a corner, you are going to get bitten at some point. And so that's what Adil is pointing towards. If I have my, I mean, the way I do transplants is everybody gets this and everybody gets this. um actually low risk people we sometimes just do flow pras and if the flow prs are completely negative we don't run single antigen beads but they have an anti- a comprehensive dependable antibody um uh, detection and they have cross matches and then we proceed and even then we get into trouble so the 3% amr rate that i'm quoting is with all this right so if you're going to cut that corner a little bit it may go up a little bit you may see a little bit more so you may do the first 20 transplants and you'd be okay and you say nothing has happened i'm good but then the next five you have all of them may have acute antibody mediated rejection so uh, over a long period of time these things do catch up so you have to be careful because sometimes we get into this my experience has been anecdotal experience is just that it's anecdotal experience that's why we have data so eventually you'll you, you so every time you're doing this you're playing russian roulette uh, you know with a patient's kidney because you may run into trouble so the the most optimal way is to do it this way but if you don't have the money to do it then your cho- choices are to take a little bit of risk or take a real risk and leave them on dialysis where they'll die in 5 years. So that's that's the question you're answering. So you have to step back a little bit and see yeah this is from an immunological standpoint this is not ideal but is this risk better than leaving them on dialysis? Obviously if you got means I would like to do this. If you don't have means then this is an assumable risk assuming a living related transplant with completely negative cross matches. yeah my point is that when you do, to cut the cost in this low risk patient you do a flow cross match 
and you do the screening uh, phenotype panel. And if the screening phenotype panel of the beads comes positive, you define an MFI like, for example, 1000 and a ratio of uh, one lambda, we have a ratio of three. And then you say, now I will do a SAP. So that will, to some extent, minimize the cost and also minimize the risk. Yeah, what, what, I, what I was led to believe was that the, the screening test costs $100,000, the SAB costs uh, no, $100,000, 100,000 rupees, the SAB test costs 100,000 rupees. I don't know what an AHG CDC costs, but that has to be cheaper. It's a 50 year old test. Um, but the, the only problem with not doing an AHG CDC and doing a flow cytometric cross match is that flow cytometric cross matches sometimes miss complement fixing antibodies. So you may get a very nasty surprise that way. So you just have to be careful with that. And I think that's a question that um, the HLA lab people should answer. I don't proceed with a transplant without any AGCDC, and that is the standard of care here. AGCDC is only 25, 15 to 25,000. It's not that expensive, you're right. And, and how much does it cost to get flow PRA or a Luminex screen? A screening uh, and Luminex PRA beads this, uh, Phenotypic beads is about 10,000 rupees. Oh, that's not too much then. That's not too much. I mean, I mean, it's 10,000 rupees, but it's not like 100,000 rupees. So yeah, you can then supplement actually in this particular situation then, if you want to do an AHGCDC and flow cytometric and supplement it with a Luminex screen, if it's just 10,000 rupees, that may be a very cost effective um, 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 way to get a reasonably comprehensive uh, AMR risk. But these are these are the problems that these are practical problems. So you're actually adjudicating uh, clinical decisions based on cost effectiveness, and that's important in that milieu. So I think if we adjust this, where you're doing AG, CDC, and flow, and doing a Luminex screen, which adds ten thousand to the bottom line, but then gives you a very comprehensive antibody as well as um, uh, cross match information, then I think that would give you a lot of confidence that uh, things are going to work well. So uh, any conclude, I, I think Dr. Tarif has a comment and a question that maybe a request and maybe if we also consider con concluding the session, it's uh, <laughs> no. 22 minutes Shall after midnight. I'm uh, sorry, I think uh, it's I, a me, wonderful discussion. Why I'm saying that uh, the longer we stretch, it's great. I think, but that may be a negative predictor for future interest. So I just want to make sure that our passion stays alive and we, we always have a next Sunday. So um, uh, uh, I think the, the today's session is amazing. This is, this is such a good discussion and such a good engagement. I, I know, I mean, thank you very much. And it was wonderful. Uh, you know, only the interested people I probably left well, to listen to the end. Uh, I think what I'm going to suggest is I've already written it down that uh, maybe uh, the three A's and, uh, and Irfan Aga you know, they can combine together and write a statement paper, minimum base standards that are needed for Pakistan. It will be wonderful, you know, for all the nephrologists to understand uh, to its core that was discussed in the last two hours or so. I think that would be great. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be happy to help. But I think, I think my request to you would be to make some noise and get some KPD action going. That's badly needed in Pakistan. I mean, I would be very, very wary of desensitizing people in Pakistan, just the cost and the infection risk and all that. You know, you'll, you'll get the kidney transplant done, but then you might kill them with TB or something. So I mean, you know, I, I worry about that all the time. So KPD is, is what we need to have. Uh, what we need to have happen in Pakistan. And I think we need to have minimum standards of practice so that people can follow those guidelines. Um, or at least, you know, have kind of a roadmap. Uh, I don't know what the enforceability of that is going to be, but, you know, this is what societies do and this is what um, organizations do. So if you guys all who are practicing this, if you're all on the same page, it will happen. But I agree with uh, Umar. I think this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, it's been a privilege to be a part of it. And uh, I hope that this was of some use to everybody who was um, online. And so I think this will dovetail nicely with our next topic, which is antibody-mediated rejection, I think, which is 
in the next few weeks. So we'll kind of sort of continue this conversation that what happens if we don't listen to Dr. Manzoor and try to transplant them with very little stuff. Uh, and then we are dealt, dealing with an antibody mediated rejection um, two weeks down the line. So we'll kind of pick, pick up the conversation uh, at that point. But uh, I appreciate everybody's being present here. It really is, um, well, it's very late. I don't know what time it is in Pakistan, but it's very late, I'm sure. So thank you, everybody, for being here. And um, good night to everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.